Hey guys, welcome to the Supplement Engineer channel. My name is Robert Chinesky. Today we're going to be talking about inosine and whether you should be supplementing with it or not to improve performance. Before I get into today's topic, check out the link below. There you'll find my article at Tiger Fitness that goes into all of what I'm about to say in much greater detail. So let's start at the top. What is inosine? It's a building block of DNA and RNA. It's formed when another purine compound called hypoxanthine binds to the C1 carbon of ribose via a beta N9 glycosidic bond. Now, in case you weren't aware of this, nucleosides are basic compounds of all cells, and inosine is also an intermediate in the breakdown of various purines and purine nucleosides to uric acid, as well as pathways of purine salvage. Inosine also results from the dephosphorylation of ATP, which many of you know is the cellular currency of exercise. So during exercise, in order for your muscles to obtain energy, ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate, is hydrolyzed to adenosine diphosphate, ADP, meaning that ATP has one of its phosphate groups cleaved. Now these bonds between the phosphate groups are known as high energy bonds, and when they're broken, such as during hydrolysis during exercise, a considerable amount of energy is released, which is then used to power your muscles during exercise. If we perform a series of hydrolysis reactions, We'll then convert ADP to AMP, which is adenosine monophosphate, meaning it's got one phosphate group. From here, adenosine monophosphate can be converted to inosine via two mechanisms. We can first remove adenosine via the adenosine deaminase enzyme to form inosine monophosphate, or IMP. This is then followed by dephosphorylation, meaning removal of a phosphate group, by a nucleotidase to form inosine. Or the second way we can get inosine from AMP is removing a phosphate group via nucleotidase, which is another enzyme, to form adenosine, followed by deamination, which is the removal of the NH2 amino group to form inosine. Now, inosine came and went, and so it was popular for a time in the 70s, then went away, and like most things in the supplement industry, it pops back up. So in the late 90s, it popped up again, and it suffice it to say it didn't perform so well, which led to it being kind of thrown in the back closet of the supplement industry and forgotten about until recently, as you've seen yourself. So let's go back and look at some of the research from the 90s and see what it had to say about inosine's effects on athletic performance. The first study on inosine was involving nine highly trained endurance runners in a double-blind placebo-controlled crossover study. Each subject consumed an inosine supplement of 6 grams per day for 2 days, or placebo. They then performed three different exercise tests consisting of a submaximal warm-up run, a competitive 3-mile treadmill run, and a max treadmill run. Researchers measured VO2 max, time to exhaustion, oxygen uptake, ventilation, respiratory exchange ratio, and rating of perceived exertion, as well as a truckload of metabolic markers including glucose, pyruvate, lactate, phosphorus, and uric acid. At the end of the trial, researchers noted that no improvements whatsoever were found when subjects took inosine in their max treadmill runtime, their 3-mile runtime, their VO2 max, or any other significant metric that they recorded. In fact, when the runners consumed the placebo that the researchers gave them, the, the team of sports scientists noted that they actually improved performance more than they did compared to the inosine supplement, meaning that inosine actually impaired the athlete's performance. So at the end of this, the researchers concluded by saying, based upon our data, we conclude that inosine is not an effective ergogenic aid to enhance athletic performance of an aerobic nature, meaning it doesn't improve cardio training. Now, the second study with inosine involved 10 competitive male cyclists, each receiving either 5 grams of inosine daily for 5 days or placebo. Following this, the subjects completed a Wingate bike test consisting of a 30-minute self-paced cycling performance bout as well as a constant load supermaximal cycling sprint to fatigue. So basically, they pedaled really, really fast until they got exhausted. At the end of the trial, researchers noted that there were no significant differences whatsoever between the group when the group consumed placebo and when they consumed inosine across a variety of measurables including peak power, end power, fatigue index, total work completed, and post-test lactate. So again, supplementing with inosine has no benefit on performance. Based on the outcomes of the study, the researchers said that, quote, inosine supplementation does not appear to improve aerobic performance and short-term power production during cycling and may actually have an ergolytic effect under some test conditions. Now, ergolytic means 
it would actually impair performance. So it's not ergogenic, meaning it would enhance performance, but ergolytic, meaning it subtracts from performance. So that's two cases down, and so far inosine is 0 for 2. Let's look at the third study, where they jacked up the dose considerably in here, and they went with a whopping 10 grams. So in previous studies, they've used 5 gram doses. In this study, they used 10 grams, so double the amount. So surely this is going to have some kind of benefit for the athletes, right? Well, maybe not so much. So the third study, again another small one, involving 7 trained men. They received either a placebo or an inosine supplement. The dosing phase was separated by a six-week washout period, so the same seven men consumed either a placebo and ran through the testing trial, then they waited six weeks, and then they consumed the 10 grams of inosine and performed the entire test again. So each time the subjects reported, they completed three exercise sessions. So they reported on at the baseline day, on day six of supplementation, and on day 11 of supplementation. And the three tests they completed were five different six-second sprints, a 30-second sprint, and a 20-minute time trial. Now, researchers collected blood samples prior to supplementation, which is baseline, as well as on day 6 and 11 to track uric acid levels and something called 2,3-DPG. So, after completing the inosine run and the placebo run, researchers noted that supplementing with inosine did not significantly improve average power, peak power, total work, or post-exercise blood lactate levels. Interestingly enough, they noted that uric acid concentrations were significantly increased when the men supplemented with inosine. As a result of this, researchers concluded that inosine demonstrated no ergogenic effects and that it may even potentially lead to health complications if taken over long enough time. And it's here that we get into some of the health complications and downsides of inosine supplementation in addition to its ergolytic effects. So follow with me along with this. Uric acid is a waste product that results from the digestions of foods that are high in purines, such as beer and various types of meats. Now our bodies can also naturally produce uric acid when we break down and recycle components of our DNA and RNA. And under normal circumstances, uric acid is filtered out by our kidneys and excreted through the urine. However, in times of impaired kidney function when the body cannot properly dispose of uric acid, it can accumulate in the blood leading to a condition known as hypo, hyperuricemia. So why is this bad? Well, it's pretty well known that high uric acid levels are associated with gout, which is a disorder characterized by red, hot, painful, swollen, and tender joints. Hyperuricemia also leads to crystal formation, overly acidic urine, and kidney stones. On top of that, several cohort studies have found a pretty solid association between high uric acid concentrations and hypertension. And if that wasn't bad enough, some researchers also believe that high uric acid levels can play a role in various neurological diseases as too. So what does all of this have to do with inosine? Well, if you go back to the third study that we just discussed, researchers noted that inosine supplementation, in addition to it not improving performance, actually increased uric acid levels in the body. So with this train of thought, supplementing with inosine could eventually lead to hyperuricemia and with it gout, kidney stones, and high blood pressure. And interestingly enough, a separate study involving patients with multiple sclerosis or MS noted that one-fourth of the patients in the study developed kidney stones when supplementing with inosine. Now here's the really interesting thing. The patients in that trial were only receiving 500 milligrams, about a tenth of the dose used in some of those research trials. It's worth noting that once the patients were taken off of the inosine supplement and given proper hydration, their kidney stones went away. But still it remains, if you're somebody with impaired kidney function or a suspect to high uric acid levels, inosine supplementation should not be on your list. In all this talk about inosine, you may have heard some people bring up the fact that supplementing with creatine depletes the body of inosine, which thereby reduces exercise performance and hinders energy production during training. Now before you go and start throwing out all of your tubs of creatine monohydrate and flushing it down the toilet like a crack fiend or something, just sit back, take a deep breath, and relax. Sports scientists have actually looked into creatine supplementation and noted that it has zero effect on muscle inosine monophosphate concentrations during training, even when training is high as 70 to 80% of your VO2 max. 
In fact, researchers noted that supplementing with creatine actually enhances performance because it reduced the muscle inosine levels. Now that might sound a bit confusing depending on who you're listening to and what you've read, but here's how it basically works. During exercise, your muscles consume ATP to contract. As long as you're able to regenerate ATP, your muscles keep firing and performance remains at a high level. However, when ATP demand exceeds the, your ability to regenerate ATP, fatigue sets in and your performance falls off very rapidly. Additionally, as you consume more and more ATP, levels of adenosine diphosphate, ADP, and adenosine monophosphate, AMP, increase. This leads to the upregulation of an enzyme known as myokinase and AMP deaminase that ultimately increases production of inosine monophosphate, or IMP. Now, two separate studies have investigated the ergogenic benefits of creatine and carbohydrate supplementation. Both have noted to delay the increase in inosine monophosphate concentrations in skeletal muscle compared to a placebo. Researchers have interpreted these results to mean that decreasing levels of inosine monophosphate actually leads to improvements in performance. So if anything, having reduced levels of inosine monophosphate in your muscles as a result of creatine supplementation, for instance, is actually a very good thing. And as we've already explained in great detail already, supplementing with inosine in no significant way helps performance. There's also zero evidence in humans that any sort of synergistic effects exist between supplementing with creatine and inosine. Now, I'm not going to pretend to know everything about supplements. Hell, I had to look up inosine before I even wrote the article in the first place. So, potentially, there's some research I don't even know of. You know, maybe the people that put out inosine supplements can help show me the ropes. And so I contacted them on social media to see maybe they could alert me to some research on inosine I was not aware of. So take a look at this and see what happens. Following this exchange, I was quickly blocked on social media, as you would imagine. Anytime you try to ask a question somebody doesn't have an answer for, they take their toys and they run away. And so with that said, here's how I'm going to leave things with inosine. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make this extremely simple for you dense guys out there. Inosine sucks as a supplement. It does not enhance performance. If anything, it hinders performance during training. And so guys, there you have it. Thanks for sticking around. I know this was a long video. It got pretty deep at times, but thanks for watching. Leave a comment down below. Give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content. Thanks.